Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're about ready to start um, the webinar for this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, on behalf of the Baycrest CLRI, we're really uh, pleased to be able to share the uh, webinar with you this afternoon. And maybe it's apropos that it's about story in the midst of the stories that are being created over the last 24 hours um, in, in, our, in our world. Um, there certainly is a, a lot of, of stories uh, that, are, that are going on right now. So we're going to talk to you today about the role of story in long-term care practice and education. My name is Melissa Taffler, and I'm one of the interprofessional educators with the CLRI at Baycrest. Uh, Dan Yashinsky, I had been working here at Baycrest as a storyteller in residence, which is also what I do in the big wide world outside. <laughs> so nice okay. to virtually meet everybody. <laughs> right. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into it. We only have an hour, and I know that certainly goes by quick. Um, if you do have any challenges with audio uh, or connection, certainly feel free to uh, let us know in the uh, in the chat box, please, and, and we'll do our best to um, see if we can sort it out for you. Who had a question? A raised hand, anyway. Oh, okay. So, if you can use the chat box. Okay, um, so is it Sue? Sue. Sue, could you use the chat box, please, for your question, and we'll be able to address it uh, easier that way. Okay. Okay, so first, just a word about the CLRI. Um, if you're new to accessing resources through the CLRI, or this is your first time um, it, having any uh, connection to us, we are um, partners with the long-term care sector uh, with the mission to build capacity through training, education, innovation, and knowledge mobilization. And we're really here to improve the health and well-being of people who live and work in long-term care. And you can see uh, the different gears here that um, just focus in on our, our areas of uh, knowledge building and expertise. And uh, certainly um, webinars are one part of the education work we do, um, but there is many others. And we really encourage you to check out our website um, to see all the resources that are available to you. Our slides are advancing a little slow, so please just be patient. Sorry for these pauses. Um, so just a, a, a word about acknowledgement. We are supported, uh, our funding is supported um, partly through the Government of Ontario, and um, important to say that the views expressed here don't necessarily uh, reflect the views of the province. Okay. So, uh, what are the objectives today? We're here to talk about stories and their role in long-term care education and practice. And want to share with you um, our experience and, and some knowledge that, uh, that we have uh, developed uh, through our work here uh, together at Baycrest um, and evaluation work that we've done on how stories uh, are very effective in stimulating empathy and reflection and perspective taking, all facets of important, that are important to good professional practice and good work on teams. We're going to talk a little more broadly, too, about the role of narrative in, in healthcare practice. What does the research say about the importance of deriving information and knowledge from narrative? And then also we're going to tell you a little bit about the uh, approach that we use that we call story care and how we implemented it at Baycrest. So in order to do this, uh, the webinar is, is going to take you through some slides uh, to provide you with some foundational information about the role of story and the way we use it in, in practice with families and with patients and also as an approach to developing good interprofessional um, dynamics with, with our teams. Uh, we have some video footage that we're going to show you that helps bring the learning to life. It helps really illustrate the concepts that we're talking about. And with this virtual platform, we're going to do our best 
to try to uh, have folks participate in some responsive exercises, which will help you um, uh, help us emphasize to you the value of listening to stories. Okay, why do stories even matter in the first place? Well, uh, we are actually storytelling beings. We're we're wired for stories. Uh, we derive meaning through stories in all sorts of ways. We live and uh, we embody our place in the world through stories, and stories really do shape our experiences. Really, from the time we're very young, stories are embedded in us by our, our and infused through through what we come to know about the world around us, through our family, through um, the stories that we hear, the stories that we uh, are shared that are shared from us by our, our families through generations before us. So stories really come to live within us in a very essential way. We also listen and communicate through stories. Um, stories are how we actually most effectively absorb and hold on to information because, as I said, our brains are wired to pay attention to stories and also to remember stories. One of the great things about stories is it triggers both sides of our brain. So they make us think and they make us feel at the same time. And that's one of the reasons that uh, stories are so effective at, um, at helping us hold on to information. So research also tells us overwhelmingly that stories are a primary source of, of communication and that when we talk in stories, we, we actually win a disproportionate share of our listeners' attention. So stories are an important source of information and it really does behoove us to think about how we use stories um, in our life and how we actually use stories in our work. So thinking about though um, our roles as, as educators and clinicians, um, I wonder if you just reflect for a moment on how much you actually derive uh, information through stories or how much you're aware that you derive information through stories. What do we actually believe that we come to know through stories versus all of the other sources of information that are uh, around us in our work, our charts, our formalized assessments, um, our evidence-based practice knowledge? You know, so this is um, an interesting um, an interesting opportunity to think about how much do stories matter in our work? And is there more room for stories in our work? So here's a picture of our, our storyteller in residence, Dan Yashinsky, talking with a patient um, and in a story exchange. I don't know if you want to it, give any context uh, to this. Uh, it was in the palliative unit, and he and I were good friends, and we swapped many a story mm -hmm. over the time I, I knew him. Okay, what about the role of stories in interprofessional education? Um, we know that um, levels of uh, interprofessional competence are dependent on breadth and depth of opportunities for learning and for practice experience with, from, and about other health providers. And the universal nature of stories offer experiences with that kind of breadth and depth where we can step outside of the clinical milieu and where we can allow ourselves to lose the tendency to see issues through our traditional lenses and our traditional frameworks. So stories really highlight different ways of knowing. They can be used to facilitate these foundational elements of interprofessional practice. When we share stories with our team members, we also create a safe environment for learning from one another where there's no right or wrong and we can step out of our clinical roles for a while and meet in a different kind of space. Learning through the lens of stories can also strengthen relationships because of the humanistic nature of the exchange and insight into awareness of one's personal journey, and that can foster a greater sense of trust. And we know without the basis, without trust as a basis, um, and the open sharing of experiences, it becomes very challenging to develop true interprofessional collaborations that are effective. Stories that we share also highlight the importance of deriving information through a less clinical, more intuitive way of knowing. So explaining or, des or describing more nuanced understandings of clinical situations, of encounters with patients and families that are really not accessible through more traditional sources of data. So it's an opportunity for us 
to really share in, in a much more rich way um, our perspective on a situation. So we'll come back to this photo in a minute, but or, or through the, actually the course of the webinar, but um, it is um, a, an image that we use um, when we've had uh, our storyteller in residence in sessions with groups or with patients, um, and it had come to be known um, across the campus um, as, a, as a visual reminder of the importance of stories and that stories are part of the, the culture of our organization. Yeah, just to add to that, we, we, we have a button too that has that same image of the two people talking and listening to each other. And on the button, it says, tell me your story. Uh, and many volunteers and staff members wear that button. And that's a great opening for them when they're meeting a resident or, or family members. Yeah, what people have told us is, is when they wear that button um, or when people see them wearing that button, there's an invitation that is, um, that is present that says, I, I'm aware that your story is important and I'm here to listen to your story. So this is a, a quote from Rita Sharon, who comes out of Columbia University in New York and is one of the champions of the field of narrative medicine, which you may have uh, heard of. And she says, a scientifically competent medicine alone cannot help a patient grapple with the loss of health or find meaning in suffering. Along with scientific ability, she says physicians, but I'll say healthcare providers, need the ability to listen to the narratives of the patient, grasp and honor their meanings, and be moved to act on the patient's behalf. So this idea of being moved to act is something that um, I really believe stories uh, help us become um, effective in. It's the, really the layer uh, that, oh, that kind of um, overlays the, the, all the medical information and all the health information that we know of a patient that really propels us to come along with them in their, their journey. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, one of the doctors who's been a, a really important uh, inspiration for the work here at Baycrest, Dr. Michael Gordon, um, tells us something. He, he said one time, he said, when he meets a patient, an elderly patient, he doesn't always say to them, how are you? He likes to say, who are you? And he says that that one change opens them up and creates a story the, the, the possibility of story exchange, and it makes a big difference in the, in the ultimate trust level that he has with the patient. Yeah, and it's something that he teaches his uh, medical students and he has for decades. So this idea of narrative practice is certainly something um, that's uh, a, a well-known field, and, and we certainly um, take a lot of the research and ideas that are developed through narrative practice into the work that we do in story care. But uh, essentially, it really is the idea that healthcare practitioners know what to do with stories and that we are more aware um, and attuned to the role of story in the care setting, both between patients and families and also amongst healthcare practitioners themselves. Okay, there is good research into the role of story. Um, and evidence on uh, health outcomes when stories are a larger part of a clinical encounter. So as we, as we mentioned before, um, it really um, improves the ability to make meaning for the clinician or the healthcare provider of the patient experience through understanding the, the role of illness or the, 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 what is important to the patient in their own words. Um, stories push back on the reductionism of, of biomedicine, this idea that um, everything that we do is evidence-based and that we are guided by very clinical types of uh, uh, decision-making processes. Um, for practitioners themselves, uh, stories become a vehicle for self-reflection, which is really critical in the work that we do in long-term care. And like I mentioned about stories being almost the filter through which our clinical information gets pushed through, um, it allows us to keep an empathetic stance. So when we know the story of a patient and when we know the story of a family and when we're attuned to that story, we really are able to elicit and work from a place of empathy and hold that empathy longer. And research also shows that it does generate trust. When, when we know amongst teams each other's stories, um, there's a, there is a, a, 
a good um, basis for building trust among uh, practitioners and patients and um, between practitioners. Okay, um, so I, I mentioned that we were going to tell you a little bit about how story care uh, was implemented at Baycrest and, and what we've done to um, to integrate the role of story into the life of residents and families. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll jump in, although I have to say I really like listening to you, Melissa. So it's very tempting to just mm -hmm. sit back and say, keep going, keep going. Um, so one of the strange things about this in, in encountering you through the, the webinar is that it's not exactly storytelling style. Uh, normally, you know, we like to meet face to face and listen to each other, exchange stories. So I'm, I'm picturing everybody out there in Ontario or wherever you are um, li listening and on your computers and here in the office of Melissa Taffler, there's some beautiful artwork and some thank you cards from all the people who've done arts and learning here. And, uh, and right in front of me on the desk is a Matrushka doll, the Russian doll, all seven little dolls, the dolls skip one within the other and a wooden spoon, which I'll come to in a minute. So you can picture us sitting here and I'm gonna picture you all out there. Uh, but really, if at any point you have a thought or a question or a, a story connection you'd like to make, just use the chat box because it'll make it much less of a lecture and much more of, a, of an exchange. Uh, so let me pause just for a second now and, and if anybody wants to jump in, just, just go ahead. Um, but by the way, also in the room to, to save us from our technological uh, issues is Raquel Meyer, Dr. Meyer. So thank you very much for being part of it. Now, I wanted to say one thing about story care here at Baker. So I came in uh, five years ago to work as a storyteller in residence, which was, has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, and one of the things I realized right away is that any long-term care uh, community, including certainly here at Baycrest, um, which is both a place for residents and also patients on the hospital side of Baycrest, um, is a village of storytellers. From the first day I got here, I was hearing stories from everybody from patients in rehab to residents in the long-term care, the Apotex, to the staff, to the volunteers. Uh, everybody here seemed to carry a story and they seemed to enjoy the opportunity um, to, to tell it, to share it. So as a storyteller, it's been a, it's an ideal environment. I really could go out as a listener. I could bring my own stories, personal, family, folk tales. And everywhere I went within the organization, um, there were there were there were times and places where people were were very willing to exchange stories, including the people in long term care who found it hard to tell their own stories at this point in their lives. At which point I could turn to their family members or to their private companions um, or, or, or to the other staff or to the volunteers and say, let's find out who this person is, even though they can't tell their own story well anymore. So uh, all of which is to say, um, going back to that Russian doll that I put out on the desk, I'd like you all to picture seven dolls, one within the other. When you see somebody first, you see the outside. That's the first doll. But you don't have to spend too much time with them to start to realize there's an inner and then a, a further self. And then, you know, there's the feelings that they have, the dreams that they have, the values that they share, the, the, the stories that they carry with them in their lives. So I would say in story care, it's taking the time to know people beyond that first level where you meet them and to take time to see which are the, what are the things they carry within them. And we do that in three ways here. We do it through storytelling, through story listening, and what we call story keeping. And all three of those we'll cover in the, in the webinar today, really by way of just introducing you to them. But in truth, all of you already do these three things. In any, any long-term care community, these things are being done every single day. And in a way, what I think it We'd be happy if you end the webinar thinking to yourself, yeah, yeah, I know, I know those things. We're just giving you a new way to name them and to value them. So we just call it story care. 
But those are the three elements, and we'll be looking at that in a, in a moment. So that's a much younger me, and that's my friend to my left, Angela Sidney. And Angela Sidney was a native elder up in the Yukon, and I used to go there often to talk to her and listen to her stories. And I wanted you to meet Angela uh, because she said something really important and I think very relevant to long-term care work. Um, near the end of her life, she said to me, uh, you know, I have very little money to leave my grandchildren. She said, my stories are my wealth. And that to me has been a guiding principle in any of the work around story care is that the people you meet, uh, to think of them as carrying a wealth of stories. Again, whether they can communicate them well anymore or not is not the point, but within them, they carry a treasury of stories. Angela was uh, revered in the elder, in the Yukon as an elder. She knew many you know, history, geography, craft, you, you name it. She got the Order of Canada. And I would like to in some way honor Angela by, by, by bringing you all into this world of story care and reminding us all that people that you meet in long-term care carry a wealth of stories. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll just invite you all to think for a moment I, I, I sure wish we were all in one room and drinking a cup of coffee together so we could hear this uh, directly, but uh, we all come from a storytelling lineage. We have a background of stories. And if you were right here in front of me, I would ask you, uh, who's your storyteller? Who are the people you've grown up with who have carried stories that you still know and you still think of and are guided by? Because, you know, you spend your life, we're all like a, a human sponge of stories. We, the, the people we love and we care for, they tell us their life experiences. We remember these things. And I'll give you one very little example from my own grandfather who grew up in Romania. And he used to tell me about the neighborhood bully and how Vasile, who was the neighborhood bully, came to him one day. And my grandpa was only about five years old. The bully was about 10. And he came to my grandpa and said, Nikki, how would you like to learn a new word? And my grandfather was a curious little kid. So he said to Vasile, yeah, I, I'd like to learn a new word. So Vasile told him a word that he'd never heard before. And unfortunately, it was a very rude word. But my grandpa hadn't heard it. And he said, what does that word mean? And Vasile said, well, go ask your mommy. She'll tell you. A setup, right? So he goes back to his mother and says, Mommy, I learned a new word. And he says the word to his mother. She's horrified. It's a terrible word. In the Romanian language, never say that to your mother. She says, Go talk to your father. Goes to his father. He says, I learned a new word, Daddy. And I said it to Mommy. And he says the word to his father. And his father lifted his hand and slapped my little grandpa. And it was the very first time, and I think it was the last time he ever got slapped. But he started to cry and he said, why did you slap me? And his father said, because you said a very rude word and you said it to your mother and you can't use language like that in this house. And my grandpa said, yeah, but it was, but it, Vasile told me to say that word. And then his father said, oh, Vasile told you to do that. Yeah, and he said, I should say it to mommy. Oh, I see, I see. Well, you, that slap isn't for you, Nikki. I gave that slap to you so you can go out and give it back to Vasile. At which point, my little grandpa felt much better, ran outside, <clears throat> hit little Vasile. And he used to tell me that story all the time as a warning how to deal with bullies. And guess what? That became what Arthur Frank calls uh, a companion story. Art Frank has done some nice books around storytelling in, in healthcare as well. A companion story, meaning a story that accompanies you through life. So again, I'll invite you just to reflect for a moment. Uh, what would a companion story be for you? And who is a storyteller that's given you those stories in your own life? Okay. Okay. And while we're waiting for some some. Uh, responses to come in, and I think they're slowly starting to come in. We'd like to show you uh, a video um, of, of just some of the, the uh, practitioners that we've asked this same question to that have shared their responses with us.
I think, can I just mention too, as, as you're rolling the video, yeah, thank you Kathleen Edwards for sending us a note about your great aunt who kept track of the stories of the family. And that's wonderful that you have a storyteller and you have a storyteller who, who has done that, your family chronicler. And that was our first chat box story. Thank you for sending it in. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you share it? Are you able to hear the, were you able to hear that small piece of video? Oh, no. Oh, it's Paul. Yes. No, but echoed. <laughs> yeah. No. Mainly no. Okay. Should we just try it again? Because I think. Why is it echoing? Maybe it doesn't hear it. No. No, can't hear? No. Can we? Oh. That's okay. Let's get mm -hmm. back to things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. We uh, we were hoping that that would work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Sandra Dixon, who's a psychiatric nurse here at Baycrest, talking about her, mm -hmm. the story she grew up with. And again, the, you know, who was her storyteller mm -hmm. and how the values of that came into her work as a psychiatric nurse. That is, she learned compassion and how to be a good listener and how to be uh, a good advocate for herself and for others. So um, sorry you couldn't hear it. We'll tell you how you can hear it later in the uh, in this webinar, but uh, we'll just let's keep going on. Yeah, okay? let's keep going. So a little introduction to storytelling. Oh, I know what else I wanted to ask you. Um, I grew up with a lot of sayings that you know people in the family would say, little proverbs and little sayings. So sayings are a wonderful entree when you're dealing with people. You want you don't want to have to tell a whole long story, but you want to make a storytelling connection with them. Um, I would invite you to reflect on a, a saying or a proverb that you grew up with. Um, so I, I come from a, a, a Jewish background, and, and, and we would say things like, if you had to make a choice between two things, you'd say, you can't dance at two weddings with one tuchus. Tuchus is a, your, your derriere. You have to make a choice. You can't dance at two weddings with one tuchus. So I'm going to guess everybody listening right now has a saying, a proverb, something that people used to say in the family that you still say, maybe to your kids or your grandchildren, whoever it may be. And that, that's a wonderful miniature form of storytelling. Uh, these proverbs are like the poetry of everyday life. And I would strongly encourage you to think about some of those things that you know that you can bring into the workplace and share with your colleagues and with the with the residents and their family members because guess what you give one you'll get one back from them right so again this idea of story care um, encompasses the way we break it down three components and dan just touched on the storytelling this idea that we can make time um, and space in the work that we do for stories to be shared and that we can draw on our personal stories and our family stories as a way of creating storytelling exchanges with our residents and with their family members. And by doing that, we also invite them to share those same kinds of stories and exchanges with us, 
letting them know that we uh, are um, we understand that there are many layers to a person and that we want to um, know about uh, who that person is, not just the person that we see in front of us today, but the uh, the, the compilation of experiences that make up who that person has has be has been and continues to be. The second component of story care that we um, we describe is story listening, um, the ability to acute to be in the moment with uh, residents and families and being able to listen to stories. I think that we all know the value of listening um, as, as the, those of us working in this field um, have, have kind of been, um, all, you know, our champions of, of, of listening to stories, but combined with the realities of working in long-term care, the time pressures, the mounting tasks that we have on a daily basis, and the challenges that our residents have in communicating with us, listening to stories can be more of a challenge uh, than, than it may seem at the outset. So how do we do that uh, when stories um, may be um, difficult to access? We really need to go back to our basic uh, clinical training and listening and what is what makes up effective listening skills and that eye contact and presence um, and being in the moment and body language are all components of effective story listening. Giving space and time for stories to emerge, knowing that sometimes it can take a while for that to happen. And one of the components that we talk about when helping people to return to good listening skills is looking and paying close attention to clues and cues. Remaining open about ideas and little uh, opportunities to ask about things that may lead to stories that emerge. We have a video to show you uh, that illustrates that, but I, I, I think we're going to not try again, or we'll just kind of uh, describe these videos. Um, but the village you see on the bottom of your screen, it says Laura there, and Laura is a therapeutic recreationist um, in our inpatient psychiatric uh, unit, and, and also um, she, she works in a few areas of the hospital in the long-term care home, and she talks about this idea of, um, of, of looking for stories that are yet to be told and picturing um, stories as like a door with a crack uh, with some light coming through. And if you can find a way to push the door open, then um, the stories emerge in a flood of light and it, it illuminates all kinds of things about a client, a resident and, and their situation that you may not have uh, been able to know otherwise. Can I should I jump in about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, I should say the videos that that we're that we're gonna we're going to show in the webinar, in fact, are all available. And Melissa will talk to you about how you can see them later. They're on an e-learning module. We'll come to that at the end. Um, just want to say something about the purpose of going in as a story listener, and again, the use of props and visual cues. Uh, the intention is to create openings where the residents or patients or the people you're working with um, can share their own stories. And one example with that, that uh, Laura and I were both present for, a woman had just been admitted to palliative care. And we went in to introduce ourselves and, hello, I'm Dan, a storyteller. This is Laura of Recreation. And we said, would you like a storytelling session? And the woman had just been admitted. She was in her early 50s, really, really, really uh, shell-shocked about being in that particular ward at that time of her life. And she said, no, I don't want to hear any stories. And we were just leaving. That's fine. We'll respect that, of course. And then I, I noticed that on her ankle, there was a, a circle tattoo all, the, all around her ankle. And I stopped and I said, wow, that's a pretty cool tattoo. I've never seen one like that before. And she said, yeah, I, I got it to celebrate getting fired. And she then went on to tell us that she had had a job and she got fired. And we didn't leave for 45 minutes. And all it took was that one visual cue for her to come forth and share things. And it was a huge relief to her to be able to share something of her life. And she became 
uh, just a, a wonderful um, presence on the on the ward, and in fact was discharged home after a few months. Um, so th that to me is a, a nice example of how just taking that time to really observe the person. Uh, now on the side of props, I, I want to give you one example. If you could see us right now, you would see me sitting in front of uh, next to my good friend Melissa holding a wooden spoon. And the wooden spoon is um, is a terrific prop, especially with an older population. Uh, anybody working in recreation, if you want to get a good round of stories going, bring a wooden, can't be plastic or metal, it's got to be a wooden spoon. Um, all my Portuguese friends say, yeah, yeah, it's a pazenho. That's what my grandmas would hit us with, or, you know, or, or my Romanian mother would stir polenta, or mamaliga, we call it. Uh, so, thing is, it, it's an evocative prop. Uh, although not always, it's not always the thing you might expect. Like I had a, a room full of women once in a in a in a day program here at Baycrest, and I passed the wooden spoon. I thought, oh, they're all going to be so have these warm kitchen memories. Not a single one of them liked to cook. Not a single one of them made chicken soup. That's I'm thinking, yeah, that was it. But they still had great memories from it. So one day I was in the um, in the long term care in a in an area where a lot of people were had dementia of some some degree, and uh, I pa and I told a story. Now this is a very express version of the story. I think all of you probably know a version of it called uh, Stone Soup. Anyway, poor woman has five kids. She doesn't have any food. Doesn't have any money comes to the neighbor woman, says, do you have any food I can borrow for my hungry children? Neighbor says, I'm sorry, my friend, I have no food myself. I'm very poor, just like you. Next neighbor, same thing. Next neighbor, nobody had any food. So the woman says to the kids, look, let's go out on the road and I'll find something we can, we can eat. Go out on the road and what does she find? Three stones. Picks up the stones, takes them home, puts them in a pot, water in the pot, puts it on the fire outside in the yard and starts to cook. And here now, I was telling this to the group and passing the wooden spoon around, and she's cooking and she's cooking. And a neighbor comes over and says, what are you cooking? She says, I'm cooking sopa de piedra. So this is, I know it is a Spanish story, stone soup, sopa de piedra. And the woman says, what? Stone soup? Never heard of that. She says, yeah, it's really good. It'll be fantastic, she said. It'll be a little better if I had a couple of onions, but even without onions, it'll still be good. So the neighbor woman said, guess what? You just reminded me. I have some onions at home. And if I bring the onions, can I taste the soup after? Oh, yes, of course. Onions go in. Another neighbor shows up. What are you making? Stone soup. What? Oh, it'd be a little better if I had some carrots. Yeah, yeah, I got a few carrots. Anyway, you see where the story's going. And by the end of it, the entire village has shown up with chicken and barley and parsnips. And if you were right here in front of me in this room, you could send in your ingredients to the chat box. Anyway, they made a fantastic soup. And they had a big fiesta. And afterwards, all the neighbors went home and said, you know, that's incredible. She made such a good soup with just stones. Now, that's a, that's a well-known folk tale. And uh, I was telling it to the group on that, on that floor and passing the wooden spoon. And Morris speaks up. Now, Morris says, uh, he says, I love soup. And I said to him, yeah, so do I. What's your favorite soup? So all of you who work with people with dementia, you know that that's actually a very difficult question to answer because with Alzheimer's, you lose your nouns and you lose names. And he couldn't answer that simple question. What's your favorite soup? So he smiled at me and he said, you know, I eat my soup without the names. And I was struck by that, that here he found a way to stay in the conversation and to remind everybody that the thing about soup isn't the name of the soup, it's the soup of the soup. Just as it is with him, that what's important about him is the morousness of him, not his ability to formulate a rational discourse, et cetera, et cetera. No, he, he left that behind, but he was still in the world of the imagination. And just making a time and place for him to think of soup and to imagine soup as, as we did that day, was an important way for him to stay connected. Um, so here now, I would recommend a wooden spoon. There are any number of props you can bring in, of course. You can just 
old photos, an old key, you name it. There's all of the intention, the intention being to invite stories. Um, and as a matter of fact, I would like to ask you to think of two things. So one is, what are some of the ingredients of really successful, humane, uh, long-term care? What are the ingredients that go into that soup that all of you make every day and you're part of making every single day? Every long-term care community makes its own stone soup. What are the ingredients that you bring to that that make it the most fulfilling possible for the residents and their family members and you as well and the volunteers? And, um, and the other thing too uh, is if you have a prop that you have used in your teaching and your, your interactions with residents that you would like to share through our famous but little used chat box function, <laughs> uh, please, please send it in. Yeah. Okay, some responses. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, oh, thank you, Natalia says, such a wonderful story to engage residents. And, and by the way, a word on props, thank you, Natalia, and a word on the props, too. These are, um, these are useful tools with residents, but they also elicit useful and wonderful story exchanges between um, members of, on teams. And we can use these very simple techniques to allow us to get to know each other in different ways, to elicit stories that are important to us, and that also help us find the connections with one another. Sometimes these universal themes around soup or other uh, props um, that, that elicit stories can help us find connections with one another, again, that um, allow us to see each other in new and uh, different ways. Okay, so moving on to the third uh, component of story keeping. Dan, I'm going to pass it over to you. Uh, story care. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, we call this story keeping, and the idea is pretty simple, that um, Every human being, we, we carry stories, not only for ourselves, but on behalf of our loved ones. That's obviously true if they're no longer with us and you carry their legacy of stories. It's also true, and you see this a lot in long-term care, when people no longer have the communicative ability to tell their own story. So then it comes to the volunteers and the, and the family members and the staff to try to put together a sense of who that person is. I remember very vividly a, a group of people, um, the man had had a massive stroke, he couldn't talk anymore, his wife would bring him every time to the storytelling circle, uh, always in just beautiful sweaters. I mean, the care she put into choosing his sweaters, and he was a handsome man, and she wheeled him in and, and sat next to him. And she told us his story. Actually, come to think of it, I don't really know that much about her story, but she delighted in telling us details of her husband's life and how he came over from England as a war child to be looked after here. And the family that he wound up with in Edmonton didn't want to give him back at the end of the war. They had fallen in love with this boy. And the phrase that she used was, he's an easy man to love. And she's his story keeper. So this is a huge theme in long-term care and uh, certainly, obviously, in palliative as well. Um, we had, you'll see video illustrations. In fact, if you go in the e-learning module, which I hope you will, and Melissa will tell you how to sign on to that later, you'll see uh, Sergio Dizio, famous Canadian actor, by the way, just a little digression, uh, remembering his father, how his father met his mother. And there's his father sitting next to him as he tells that story. And the father is thrilled that his son is carrying that story and tells it so lovingly. Uh, and Bella is a private companion, and we, you would hear an audio recording. I really encourage you to listen to it, because when she started to work with her um, client here at, at Baycrest, she realized that the woman still remembered a lot, but it was being lost quickly. And she made it her mission to do research on her client's life so that she really consciously became her story keeper. And, uh, and that, was, that was part of what she felt was an essential part of being a good private companion. And again, like you could say a best practice of, of that world of personal support work, private companions, and so on. She interviewed, she read, you know, talked to the family members. She said, if I'm going to look after your mother, I need to know mm -hmm. who she is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. a, she gives a nice mm -hmm. example of that. And she talks about feeling responsible um, for, for keeping her 
uh, keeping this woman's legacy alive and that when this woman asks her questions, um, that she's able with the knowledge she has about the past as much as possible to answer her and to give her information that's reflective of the questions that, that she's, she's wondering about. So this, this became really um, a, a illustration of the way she saw her role, not just as taking care of her in the here and now, but taking care of her story. So very, very briefly, and you can probably tell I like folk tales and I like the traditional stories as, as much as personal and family stories. Uh, there's a story from West Africa called the Cowtail Switch. And uh, here, and it, I, I'll, t I'll tell it because again, it sets the context for story keeping very beautifully. A hunter left his family to go into the forest. His wife was pregnant at the time. Across the river goes into the forest, but he does not come back. <clears throat> Ogalusa the hunter does not come back. Nobody really knows what happened. The days pass, the weeks pass. She gives birth to a little boy named Puli. There are your two names in the story, Ogalusa and Puli. And Puli grows up with his big brothers and his mother, and he never really talks until he's about four years old. And he looks around at the family and he says his very first words. And I'm going to guess that everybody listening to the webinar would understand what the little boy said. He looks around at his mother and his brothers and said, where is my father? And the mother says, you you have never found out what happened to your father, the hunter Ogalusa. The oldest brother says, follow me, my brothers. I have magic power to follow his trail. He leads them out into the forest. And sure enough, using his magic power, he finds the bones of their father. Also the skeleton of a leopard. Then he says, the leopard killed our father. Our father killed the leopard. Another brother says, I'll use my magic power to put the bones together. And he does. And another one says, I'll use my power to put his body there. And there's the body of their father. Another one gives the breath of life. Another one gives his heartbeat. Another one gives movement. And the last one says, I will give our father the power of speech. Ogalusa is alive again. He sits up and he says to his sons, the leopard killed me. I've been in the land of the dead. You brought me back to life. And he follows them back to the village. And when he gets back to the village, it's a great reunion. He sees his wife. He meets the little boy for the first time, Puli. And Ogalusa makes a cow tail switch. And if you could just picture the dried leather of a cow's tail with shells and beads, and it's beautiful, a sacred object. And he brings it out into the village and holds it up and says, I died in the forest. My children brought me back to life. I would like to honor the one child who did the most by giving that child the cow tail switch. And he said to the villagers, who, who did the most? Well, if, we, if you were in this room with us, I would ask you that very question. But I can't see you, and so I will just tell you what happened next. He picked up the little boy. The villagers said it was Puli who did the most. And he picked up the little boy, and he said, why did Puli did the most? How did he do the most? And they said, he is the one who said, where is my father? And if, if he hadn't asked, the search would not have begun. So he gave the little boy the cowtail switch. And there's a proverb that says, a person is not dead unless they have been forgotten. And that idea is an important one in story care that, again, whether it's death or simply that they can't communicate well anymore, who becomes their story keepers? I would, again, invite you to think about who, who you keep stories for and how that's been a part of your own life. Again, if we had time, lots of time, we would, I'd love to hear, the, hear you talk about that because that's, it turns out it's, it's how we honor those people who have shared their stories with us. We honor them by remembering them. Thanks, Dan. And um, if you want, we welcome you to share uh, any um, responses to the question, who, who are you a story keeper for, in the chat box, and we can spend a few minutes sharing your responses uh, to the group. There is um, one, um, one comment in the, chat, in the chat box from Benjamin that I want to share, and he has a strategy for the way he embeds story keeping in the Train the Trainer program uh, that he uses to train, uh, he says, 2,200 employees. Yikes. <laughs> he says, I teach them to embed small stories in compliments and introductions. These are easy for staff to incorporate all day, every day, even in passing. And here's his example. He says, hi, Jane. I love your sweater. Uh-huh. Nice. Jane, this is Bob. 
he makes amazing cakes, yeah, bakes sure. amazing cakes. Bob, this is Jane. She's been a teacher for little kids. Beautiful. That's, that's what a, a beautiful wonderful example. example. Yeah. Yep. By, by the way, as you probably know, in all of your settings, you know, it's a little problematic sometimes you say to somebody, how are you in a long-term care facility? Here at Baycrest, they would look at you and say, how should I be? Mm -hmm. you know, or don't ask. So we just say, you know, it's good to see you. But that's a beautiful example yeah. of how you bring stories right yeah. into the greeting. Yeah. Yep. Um, here's another one. Um, uh, Kathleen, thanks for your response. My, it says, my family has lived in a small village where my grandparents were the ones who owned the general store. I listened to what my mom says about her experiences with her parents in the store. For example, she didn't know bananas were yellow until she got older and started grocery shopping. There's some more to that. Yeah, so again, oh, again, um, wonderful knowledge passed along uh, through the generations. Um, and Erin says, what a lovely question to ask. Who do you keep stories for? So inviting in conversations about grief and loss. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's, an, it's an opportunity and an invitation to say to each other, to a, a resident, to a family, we, are curious and we want to know who you keep your stories for. What is it that you'd like to share with us? And as you can tell, just by the, the, some of these responses and uh, the stories that Dan has shared with you, these are just very humanistic connections that get facilitated through this way of, um, of, in, of gathering information. It, it reduces us to human to human, uh, to people interested in each other's stories and takes away um, a lot of the clinical language that for many people can be challenging, can raise feelings um, of anxiety and nervousness and brings us back to a basic human connection where we can facilitate a relationship from. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to this idea of how how you make connections with people through the language of story. Um, that's important in terms of intercultural connecting as well. And I would really encourage everybody, you probably already do it, but if you don't, I would encourage you to try finding culturally specific proverbs that you can use when you're meeting somebody from, let's say, the Philippines or Italy or the West Indies or any of the places. And we, you know, in Toronto, or well, probably across Ontario, uh, wherever you are, you have a very diverse group of people in long-term care. All they need to hear is one proverb from where they're from or where their people are from originally, mm -hmm. and it's that little key that opens them up. Uh, every Italian resident that I met here at Baycrest and Patient, if I came to them and I said this very well-known proverb that says, chi va piano va sano e lantano, which simply means uh, all the Italians on the webinar are probably nodding their heads. It means if you go slowly, you go safely and far. Chi va piano. If you go, those who go slowly. And that turned out to be a really good proverb in rehab settings because that's exactly the moral that they wanted to hold on to. They're going to get there, but it's not going to be fast. So find those cultural connections. And again, you've got a beautiful key to unlock their, their stories. And as we know, for residents with cognitive impairment, um, if we can offer up a, connect, a connection like that in their own language, if you are working in long-term care homes where there is a, pro, a high percentage of uh, residents from a particular region of the world and take, make the effort to learn some of those proverbs that are culturally relevant, um, they will go a long way in the work that you um, are able to do. So we are running short on time. Um, I was, I think I won't go into detail, but just to mention that we did do some interesting evaluation um, using story care in the palliative care unit here at Baycrest. Um, and I do have research findings uh, that I could share with you through email. Uh, we have a poster that was created um, that showed really good research out, uh, outcomes for uh, not only the patients that were getting storytelling sessions, and those were sessions that were conducted between Dan and the recreationist, uh, and then um, then we uh, had Dan and the recreationist debrief 
um, and collected that and analyzed that data, looking at what they noticed and observed through those storytelling sessions. And we also gathered data from staff who weren't necessarily directly part of the story care sessions, but, but had um, interesting observations and, and uh, perspectives to share on what it was like working and what the environment was like when stories were a, a more of an emphasis um, in the day-to-day -day, um, environment of the palliative care unit and how uh, their, their feelings on how the role of story impacted um, on, on their feelings about work. So I would just uh, mention that to you and let you know if you were interested, I could certainly share more of that uh, study with you. Um, okay, we're gonna just skip right now to what are some resources that we can offer you. Um, there are uh, resources that are available uh, number one, there's a website called storycare.ca, and there's a compilation of lots of information there on story care, uh, some articles that have been written, uh, and some um, videos that you can access, so please take a look at it. We uh, did develop a learning module where, as Dan mentioned, those videos that we couldn't play today are located, and they are situated within these different components of the module that describe the different elements of story care. We have that module available and we are working on a wider spread availability. So um, please let me know if you're interested and I will absolutely be back in touch with you about how to access that module. And finally, Dan and I are available for on-site training. We do work uh, um, as trainers and, and facilitators of uh, this work. And if you're interested in bringing these ideas to your long-term care facility through um, a, a more intensive training, we can work with you to, um, to deliver, develop something that we can deliver that would meet the needs of your facility. So those are the resources that are available. And um, I think we're really basically out of time, but I, I do want, maybe I'll pass it over to you say thank you uh, for, for all of you who participated on behalf of the CLRI. Uh, we really appreciate um, your participation and certainly um, here is how to reach us um, in all the different ways to reach us if you want to connect and please do. We really uh, look forward and um, really do want to hear from you. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone, and thank you for bearing with us as we learn the technical um, <laughs> challenges mm -hmm. of the GoToWebinar. We'll get better. Um, I see a, a number of people said they're interested, so we'll follow up with the chat box people. Thank you for doing that. Um, we really encourage you to take a 60 seconds and fill in our evaluation form. It really helps us maintain our funding from the ministry. Um, and we all want funding for long-term care, so please fill them in. Uh, and we welcome your feedback and any new topics you would really like to see featured. Mm. Bye for now. Bye. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much, everybody. <laughs> Stay safe. Yeah. Okay. Boom. <laughs> okay. Boom. <laughs> all right, as we do.